I rejoiced to witness for the Lord and to help my friends and loved ones prepare for the soon coming of Jesus. Some of the more formal brethren, however, considered me too zealous. And you must know, my dear, it is not quite uh, seemly for one of your age and sex to be so... so active. A young girl should not be going around talking to people like you do. But, ma'am, did not our Lord say, Go ye therefore and teach all nations? How dare I disobey? From the way you have been pulling yourself forward, young lady, tis obvious that you are suffering from the sin of pride because you have won so many people to Christ. It is God whom I put forward, brother, and God has done the winning. I have merely been the messenger to tell people of God's love. Is that not what the Bible tells us to do? It is all well and good to wish to serve the Lord, young Ellen, but you are too inexperienced to know how these things are done. You should wait and be guided by those who are older and experienced than yourself. But, Elder, the, the time is so short. People must be warned. I cannot bear the thought of those I love perishing. I cannot wait. Let come what would, I determine to please God and to live as one who expected the Savior to come and reward the faithful. In my simplicity, I expected my brethren and sisters in my home church would understand my feeling and rejoice with me that Jesus was about to return. One evening, my brother Robert and I attended a class meeting. It was such a great relief to receive the blessing I had sought for so long. Now my joy is unbounded. It is wonderful to know my Redeemer is coming soon. Like You're right. I, so cool. I look forward to his, his coming that I, may, that I may go home with him. Now, Sister Ellen, wouldn't it be more pleasant to live a long life of usefulness doing others good than to have Jesus come speedily and destroy poor sinners? Elder... I long for the coming of Jesus and the end of sin. Then all believers will enjoy sanctification forever, with no devil to tempt us and lead us astray. How wonderful that will be. Well, I feel great joy in anticipating the millennium. Then the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <clears throat> the hour is late. Let us close this class with prayer. Ellen, is it possible that we have been deceived in believing the Advent faith and hope? Ministers and professors of religion oppose it as bitterly as the elder did in class tonight. They say Jesus will not come for thousands and thousands of years. Robert, I have not a doubt. The Advent message is the truth. We are told that a tree is known by its fruits. And this belief has led us to seek the strength and grace only God can give. That is so. I will never be turned from my convictions. Me neither. We cannot afford to turn from the truth. Not long afterward, Robert and I attended the class meeting again. I hoped that this time the members of the class would be more receptive when we told of the Lord's goodness. <sighs> I was mistaken. Sister Ellen, it is your turn to tell the class what Jesus means to you. Since I've learned to know Jesus and have received him into my heart, I have a great peace and joy. The Lord has been so good and merciful to me. I look forward with the glad expectation of meeting my Redeemer soon. And because he is about to return, I seek earnestly for the sanctification of the Spirit of God. I... You received sanctification through Methodism. 
through Methodism, sister, not through some erroneous idea of Mr. Miller. But, Elder, it is not through Methodism that my heart has received this new blessing. It is from the truths I have learned about the personal appearing of Jesus to put an end to sin. That will be enough, Ellen Harmon. Now sit down. Robert spoke next, and some of the young people were quite moved, but others laughed and snickered. This was the last testimony I would bear in class with my Methodist brethren. About this time, the Adventists held meetings in Beethoven Hall in Portland, and our whole family attended... Oh, how exhilarating it was to ride in the sleigh with my father over to Cape Elizabeth. It was here that I heard Elder William Foy, a black Adventist preacher who had had two visions earlier that winter. I will be all right, Father. If I can sit near the platform, I can breathe better there where the crowd doesn't press so close. Why, bless you, child. You can sit right here on the bench next to me. Thank you, ma'am. This is my father, Robert Harmon. I'm Ellen. How do you do, Brother Harmon, Sister Ellen? I'm Ann Foy. It's my husband who's speaking tonight. We traveled up here from Boston, and William has told his visions all along the way. Uh, It is a, a pleasure to meet you, Sister Foy. My whole family is eager to hear Elder Foy's experiences from his own lips. Oh, uh, I I see. The service is about to begin. I'd better go find myself a seat. Sister Ellen, I get very anxious every time my husband speaks. In fact, he has told me not to sit where he can see me because my agitation distracts him. Why are you so anxious, Sister Foy? There is so much prejudice against Adventists, you know, and especially against colored people. I fear someone may take against my husband for speaking in public and do him harm. Slave hunters might even kidnap him and sell him down south. But how could they do that? Elder Foy was born free, wasn't he? Yes, indeed, right here in Maine. But that won't help if he is kidnapped. A Negro is not allowed to testify in court against whites. (gasps) Dear Sister Foy! Oh, well, no wonder you are anxious. Yes, but I do not want to distract William from his labors for the Lord. So, if I become too anxious, I will just duck my head behind you. Then he can't see how worried I am. Innumerable multitudes stood before the flaming bar of judgment. Those who were righteous were changed and were admitted into a boundless place of great brightness. But those who had denied God and rejected his warnings. And all brothers and sisters, some of them I recognized as church members and ministers, but they were not spared. All sank below into darkness. Elder Foy bore a remarkable testimony of the judgment. Night after night, as our family attended the meetings, we listened to Adventist ministers tell of the personal coming of our Lord. It was thought that Jesus would come sometime in 1843. The time seemed so short that I resolved to do all in my power to lead sinners into the light of God. Oh, I wish there were something more I could do to warn people that Jesus is really coming soon. Now, Ellen, you are not yet over your last bout of illness. You are very weak still. It wouldn't do for you to overstrain yourself. Sarah's right, Ellen. You've done a lot already. Right now, you need to rest. But surely there is something I can do right here at home. (gasps) I know! I can save my money and buy tracts and books to be distributed. Why, Ellen, that's the very thing. Beth and I will do it too, won't we, Beth? We can all use the money we earn helping Father make hats. Oh, yes. It's a wonderful idea. If only I could do something more than make the crowns of the hats. Then I could earn more money. But the crowns are the easiest part. And sometimes you are so weak you can't even do that. 
If you try to do more, you'll only get sicker. I suppose that's true. But at least I can knit stockings. <laughs> Even when I can't make hat crowns, that will help. Ellen? You're just going to have to stay in bed today. You're much too weak to get up, even to knit. But, Mother, I must work. I have to earn money for our mission project. Not today. You're not getting out of bed. Perhaps Ellen could work in bed, Mother. Then she can rest and earn money at the same time. Oh, yes. Please, Mother, let me do that. Well, we'll give it a try. I'll go get the yarn and knitting needles while Beth props you up. Ellen, I wish you would lay aside your knitting and rest. You must not strain your heart. You've not been able to get out of bed for days. But that's just why I must not stop. If I quit doing even this little work, I will not be able to give any money for the cause of God. Beth and I are ready to go buy the books now. Do you have your money ready, Ellen? Yes, Sarah. Right here in this little box. There is so little. I've been able to earn only 25 cents a day. That's a lot for one so sick. You've done a great job. That's an amazing achievement. Why, Ellen, you must have kept every cent you earned. Didn't you spend any of it at all? No. I don't need frills and fancy dresses, and I think ornaments are vain. I would rather see my money go for the work of God. The books and tracts we bought were placed in the hands of experienced persons to be distributed. Every leaf of the printed matter we purchased in this way was precious to me, for it was a messenger of light to the world bidding them prepare for the great event near at hand. The salvation of souls was the burden of my mind. Often I was so weak I had to be propped up in bed while I knitted stockings to be sold. The money from this work I used to buy books and tracts to warn people of the soon coming of Jesus and his judgment on the world. One day, as I was working, I heard a conversation between my mother and a Christian sister. But Sister Abigail, did not the minister himself read the text, The soul that sinneth it shall die. If the soul dies, how can it be immortal? <laughs> now, Sister Eunice, that's plain ridiculous. Everyone knows that the soul is immortal, whether it's a righteous soul or a wicked one. And when the body dies, the righteous soul ascends to its eternal reward, while the sinner descends into hell for all eternity. Yet the scriptures clearly say... The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Well, uh, well, um, oh, well, the sinners know nothing of the Lord. They know nothing of paradise. Their immortal souls wander in spiritual ignorance. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. But doesn't it say in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, that only the Lord has immortality? Well. <laughs> All I know is what the pastor says. And Paul in Romans chapter 2, verse 7, speaks of Christians seeking immortality. Why should they seek for what they already have? Well, Sister Harmon, I advise you and your family to abandon these strange leanings. There are rumors that the church will not tolerate these Millerite ideas much longer. All this foolishness about souls being mortal and, and Jesus coming in person before the millennium? Oh, it can only get you into trouble. My whole family believes that the Lord will come in person before the millennium. We agree with William Miller that this is a plain Bible truth. What's more, 
We do believe he will come sometime in 1843. Don't you want the Lord to come, Sister Abigail? Well, gracious, no. <laughs> You've got at least not yet. Well, I've got too much to do. Uh, what with my son's wedding and the church quilt and beat. Well, <laughs> I really must be going. Remember my warning, Eunice, about those strange notions. I'm just trying to be a friend. Jesus coming in person. The idea. And a good day to you, too, Sister Abigail. Never mind. I'll go check on Ellen. Ellen, dear, how are you feeling? A little tired, Mother, but I finished one stocking, see? Oh, you've done a very good job on it, as usual. Is there anything you need right now? No. Mother, I heard you talking with Sister Abigail. You told her that the soul sleeps in the grave until resurrection. Do you really believe that? Yes, I do. You don't believe that when a good Christian dies, he is taken up to heaven immediately, but the sinner goes directly to hell? No. In fact, the Bible gives us no proof that there is an eternally burning hell. Don't you think that if there was such a place, it would be mentioned in the sacred book? <gasps> Why, Mother! This is strange talk for you. If you really believe that, please keep it to yourself. If everyone believed as you do, they would feel safe and never seek Jesus. If this is sound Bible truth, and I believe it is, then instead of preventing the salvation of sinners, it will win them to Christ. If the love of the Lord will not save a sinner, the terror of burning forever in an eternal hell certainly won't do it. It doesn't seem right somehow that the way to win souls should be through fear. It is the love of Jesus that will subdue and attract the hardest of hearts. It was some months after this conversation before I heard anything further concerning this doctrine. But during this time, my mind had been much exercised upon the subject. When I heard it preached, I believed it to be the truth. I just received word that the pastor will be calling on us this evening. Oh, he hasn't visited us for months. Why do you suppose he's coming now? Don't you know, Eunice? It's because of our interest in the Advent doctrine, I'm sure. I know that he's very much against William Miller and anyone who believes in his teachings. That's right. And he has told me so in no uncertain terms. I really believe he is planning to eject us from the church. I can't believe that, Robert. You are one of the pillars of the church, and you do so much for the church. Mm. Besides, he doesn't have the authority... I know, dear, but I fear our days as members of this church are numbered. Our days as Methodists were indeed numbered. That evening, at about seven o'clock, the pastor rapped at our door. Good evening, pastor. Welcome. Come in, come in. Elizabeth, fetch a chair for the past. How do you do, Sister Harmon? Uh, Brother Harmon, mm -hmm. I trust you and your family are well. Uh, well enough, thank you. Can uh, Eunice get you something? A, uh, a cup of sassafras tea, perhaps? No, 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 thank you. Uh. This isn't a social call. <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll come right to the point. It is my opinion, and that of the church deacons also, that Methodism and Millerism cannot agree. This is a serious matter, Brother Harmon. You and your family have adopted a new and strange belief that the church cannot accept. With all respect, Pastor, you must be mistaken in calling this a new and strange belief. Christ himself preached the second advent to his disciples. Did he not say, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and... Yes. It is so yes. plain, Pastor, he said. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. Yes. This, this is a real promise, and I believe in its literal fulfillment. Yes, of course. 
We all know Jesus will come again, but it's a spiritual coming, brother, not a literal appearing. You've been a church member long enough to know that. When Jesus was taken up into heaven, two angels appeared to his faithful followers and gave them a precious promise. You know the words, Pastor. They said, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In like manner. The manner in which Jesus left was as a literal being, in the full sight of those on earth. Brother... It, this is the manner in which he will return. Brother Harmon, I did not come to ask the reasons for your belief. I came to tell you that you are in error and that you must drop these mistaken beliefs immediately. Christ's second coming is far off after a millennium of peace on earth when the gospel will be preached to every person and all will be converted. His coming is spiritual, not literal. But didn't Paul write, The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout from the archangel and with trumpets, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive shall be caught up together with them. Those plain words are found in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 to 18. I did not come here to trade proof texts with you. You are wrong, and I'm telling you that you must renounce Millerism. You must stop teaching this strange doctrine. But, Pastor, Jesus and his apostles taught this doctrine. They looked forward to his second coming with great joy and triumph. The holy angels proclaimed that Christ, who ascended to heaven, shall come again in glory. This is our offense, believing the word of Jesus and his disciples. Well, uh, I can't refute what you say, Brother Harmon. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm in a hurry now. I'll need more time. But this I can say. Give up these strange beliefs, or I advise you to withdraw from the church to avoid the publicity of a trial. The Advent doctrine is not a strange belief. It is a very old doctrine and bears no taint of heresy. We are conscious of no wrongdoing, and to withdraw from the church would make it appear that we are ashamed of what we believe. If we are to be charged with any sin, name it, sir. I, I really must be going now, if you'll excuse me. But I advise you... Just to withdraw and avoid the scandal. We, we prefer a trial because we can see no wrong in longing for the soon coming of our Lord. You will get your trial. Not long after, we were notified to be present at a meeting to be held in the church vestry. Because of my father's influence, the leadership of the church had no desire to present our case before a large portion of the congregation, so there were but a few people present at the trial. Arden, quiet, quiet, please. We are here to have an answer from Brother Harmon and his family to the charge of walking contrary to the rules of Methodism. This trial will now consider arguments from Brother Harmon. I have no arguments. I merely demand to know what specific rules we have violated. Well, uh, you, uh, you have attended meetings conducted by persons with ideas contrary to those of the church, teaching the literal and soon coming of Christ. And, uh, and you and your household have neglected to meet regularly with our Bible classes. I'm sure you're aware that some of our family have been away from Portland. And let me remind you, sir, that many who never attend Bible classes are still members in good standing in this congregation. <laughs> oh, quiet, quiet down, please. Will you, Brother Harmon, and all of your family confess that you have departed from the rules of this church? And will you agree to conform to these rules in the future? Sir, we dare not deny the sacred truth of God's own word as written in the Bible. We will not yield the hope of our salvation in the soon coming of the Lord Christ. Robert Harmon, if you and your family will not recant, you stand convicted of walking contrary to the rules of the church. Next Sunday... At the beginning of the love feast, all of your names will be read off the rolls of the church. This is a special announcement to the congregation. 
It is my sad duty to read off and expel the following people from the list of our members. Let me state first that these former brothers and sisters are guilty of no wrongdoing or immoral conduct. They are of enviable and unblemished character and reputation. Their only guilt is that they have walked contrary to the rules of the church. Robert Harmon, his spouse, Eunice, their children, Robert, Sarah, Elizabeth, Helen. Expulsion from the Methodist Church was quite painful for us. At this time, the words of the prophet Isaiah, found in chapter 66, verse 5, were exceedingly precious. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. There were many people in various churches who, like the Harmon family, were waiting for the personal appearing of Christ. Many of them also were threatened with expulsion from their congregations, and in some cases this brought about the desired effect. The favor of God was sold for a place in the church. We survived the separation from our home church, and with carefulness and trembling, we approached the time when our Savior was to appear. In spite of the opposition by ministers and churches, we continued to hold simple meetings. By the spring of 1843, the expectancy of the believers had reached a high point. Although the exact date of Jesus' coming was not known, Father Miller, as he was called, was convinced that the advent would occur sometime between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. But others were more anxious to indicate a specific day. As I see it, our Lord will make his appearance on the 10th of February, 1843. Ha! <laughs> What gives you that idea? Because that's the day the French seized Rome way back in 1798. That's why. <laughs> that's plum silly, Abner. Everybody knows that April 14th is the day of his coming, because that's the anniversary of the crucifixion. See? The 70 weeks ended at the time of Christ's death, so the 2300 days have to be the same. But each of the specified days passed, and nothing at all happened. Hopes were then transferred to later dates, and as these also passed by, some people became discouraged and gave up hope in the soon coming of Jesus. But most continued to believe. Camp meetings flourished, with leaders such as Charles Fitch and Joshua Himes attracting thousands of people to their lectures under the Great Tent. In our state of Maine, lesser-known preachers were also having great success. Such a one was young James White, who converted 1,000 persons in just six weeks. The Advent doctrine was expanding beyond all expectations. It's amazing. People are crowding into the meeting halls to hear Advent lectures. When the seats are filled, they stand in the aisles, jammed shoulder to shoulder. I read an article in the Signs of the Times that in Boston they have built a huge tabernacle that will seat at least 3,500 people. I have a copy of the Midnight Cry that says, J.B. Cook and Elder Himes have taken the Great Tent as far west as Cincinnati and even down into Kentucky. Mm -hmm. They're bringing the word to thousands. Yes, wife, the word is spreading like wildfire. The time is indeed near. 
The heat of the summer of 1843 crushed down on us. In Cleveland, Ohio, Elder Charles Fitch preached a powerful sermon from Revelation 18. Babylon the Great has fallen. Come out of her, my people. Elder Fitch daringly identified the entire Christian establishment as Babylon because of its general opposition to the doctrine of Christ's soon coming. Even the conservative Joshua Hines became a reluctant advocate of separation. Obviously, these actions spurred immediate and bitter retaliation from the organized churches. Look over there, Eldora. Bunch of them Millerites are going to one of them meetings. Mm, fools is what they are. Just plain fools and heathens. Hey, you Millerite! Where be your white ascension robes? Hmm. <laughs> Were you addressing us, brother? Um, I'll just ask where your white ascension robes is at, that's all. Our white robes are the purity of our souls, brother. What color is yours? Well, uh, I was just asking. In spite of the disappointment of Jesus not coming in 1843... We waited in delicious expectation in 1844, although the exact date of his coming was still a mystery. Then, in August of 1844, a dramatic event happened in Exeter, New Hampshire, that gave us the light we longed for. Joseph Bates, the ex-sea captain, was speaking at a tent meeting when a horseman rode up. Brothers and sisters, I liken the Advent movement to a sturdy ship tossed on a stormy sea, blown a bit off course, perhaps, and delayed by contrary winds, but sure to reach safe harbor when our Lord comes to gather his storm-tossed sailors to his bosom. Uh, uh, well, what's this? Oh, why, it's Brother Snow. Elder Bates, you know my brother, Samuel Snow. Why, yes, I do, Mrs. Couch. Well, Samuel has something important to say to this gathering. Now, we are all familiar with your message, as true as it is, but my brother has just arrived with new light to shed and new meat for the Lord's table. Will you let him speak? Let Brother Snow speak to us. Let's hear what he has to say. Let's hear him. Yes, yes. I agree. I want to hear what he has to say. You are most welcome to the pulpit, Brother Snow. Come up and tell us your message. Friends, uh, I have just received new light, and I uh, believe it to be a true... that the day we have waited for so long... The day that Christ will cleanse the sanctuary will take place on the Jewish Day of Atonement, which will fall on October 22nd in this year of 1844. Oh. Now, Brother Snow, how did you come to this conclusion? Well, when Jesus came the first time, he was on time. He then declared the prophetic time was fulfilled. We all know about the prophecies in Daniel 8 and 9. So by the most careful reckoning of the Jewish scholars, the 10th day of the 7th month falls this year, on the 22nd of October. Why, if you are correct, and I believe you are, we have less than three months to prepare for his coming. Time was short. Only ten weeks remained until the cleansing of the sanctuary. The midnight cry went from city to tiny village and on to the remotest country regions. The time is short. Be ready. Be ready. Ha, ha, ha. I feel elated. But we have so much to do, so many of our brothers and sisters to make ready. It breaks my heart, Father, that so many will not believe. Oh, we must not give up, Ellen. We still have time to warn many. Is this 
the shop of Robert Harmon, the hatter? Yes, ma'am. I have this fedora that needs mending. It's my husband's favorite hat. Can I leave it with you and pick it up next week? I am sorry, ma'am, but this business is closed. For good. Closed? I don't understand. The Lord is coming, sister, in just a few short weeks. I have more important business. Oh, one of those. Well, I'll just take my business elsewhere. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I am indeed one of those. Words cannot describe the activity that took place in the few weeks that preceded October 22, 1844. Crops were left unharvested in the fields, shops were closed, and workers resigned their positions. What need did people have of jobs or even food? Christ was coming in just a few more days. People needed to be warned. Sins needed to be confessed. Wrongs made right. Millerite tabernacles and the great tent had almost continuous day and night services. People gave away their most prized possessions. Well, how do, Enoch? I seen you coming up the wagon way. What you doing leading that cow? I come to give her to you, George. Mm -hmm. You've been a good neighbor all these years, and I want you to have her. Why, that there animal is worth a lot of money, and she's a real fine milker, too. Won't need her anymore. The Lord is a-coming, George, and I won't need milk where I'm going. As our expectations grew, so did the ridicule of our opponents. Ugly crowds forced cancellation of meetings in many cities. Gangs of profane men roamed the streets looking for Millerites. Yet, in spite of these things, 1844 was the happiest year of my life. My heart was full of glad anticipation. We felt great pity for those who would not believe, but we who were firm in the Advent doctrine needed each other, for scoffers and foul ruffians were everywhere. By early October, the streets of Portland were dangerous. There goes a bunch of them. Come on, man, let's get them! Come on, dear children, follow me through this alleyway. Hurry! Oh, all right. We're, we're safer now. Uh, but we'd better not stay here. Oh, we can run home from here. Our house is just a block away. We'll be safe there. Why do they act that way, Father? We have done nothing to hurt them. It's because they're frightened. Yes, that's it. Some 100 rugged, hilly miles from the busy city of Portland, Maine, is the farming village of Palmyra. Here I was born on August 14, 1821, to John and Betsy White. Unlike my sturdy brothers and sisters, I was a sickly child. Before I was three years old, I fell ill with fever and severe convulsions. After several weeks, I recovered, but with a problem that was worse than the fever. Fever's broken, but there's something wrong. Mary, I was right in the middle of needing the weak spread dough. Now, if this is another of your I, false I alarms. I call you all the way upstairs for nothing, Ma. James' head is cool now, but look at his eyes. Oh, here, let me see. Oh, turn your head to the window light, boy. Oh, oh, you poor baby. Your eyes are crossed so bad, I wonder you can see it all. My eyes turned toward the bridge of my nose so badly that everything was fuzzy. This, combined with a feeble and nervous constitution, made for a miserable childhood. However, when I was seven, my father decided I should try to attend school. All right. 
right, boys and girls, take your seats. If we're ready, the two lower grades will please get out slates and chalk to copy today's spilling assignment. The three upper grades take out your readers and study pages 24 through 36. No! I'll write the words on the blackboard. The first one is... H-O-R-S-E. Nancy, can you tell me what that spells? Horse, Mr. Blake. Hey, <laughs> good. Here's the next word. H-O-U-S-E. James, what does that spell? I, I don't know, Mr. Blake. James White, you've been in this class for two full weeks now, and you have never been able to answer any of the questions. Uh, Let me see your slate again. (laughs) Quiet, children. Now let's see it. Hmm. Can't you try to write something? I I can't see what you wrote, Mr. Blake. It's all kind of fuzzy. I understand. I'll be over to talk with your father this evening. And so, Mr. White, with James' eyes crossed so badly, word and number recognition is impossible. It would be futile and pointless to keep him in school. Uh, But, Mr. Blake, the boy is not stupid. Far from it, but with his eyes. I'm afraid he'll never be able to learn to read and write. I longed to read, to enjoy the thrilling stories of James Fenimore Cooper and Washington Irving, but it seemed that I was to remain illiterate. Oh, how that hurt. Farm work was good for me, though. By the time I was 16, my health and strength had improved. (sighs) That's work, James. It gets harder every day to heft those grain bags up onto that wagon. (laughs) Or maybe it's just that I'm getting older every day. Pa, can I tell you something strange? Uh, Of course, son. What is it? My eyes. It seems that I can see a little clearer the last few days. Well, that's fine, James. If, If my eyes become normal, maybe I could go to school. Learn to read and write and cipher. Uh, And now, boy, don't get your hopes up too high. You're ten years behind already. I I don't want you to be cast down by disappointment. Yes, sir. Slowly, week by week, my eyes improved. My excitement grew. Now I had hope of at least learning to read. Then one morning... My mother climbed the stairs to wake me. James, wake up. It's almost time for church. Oh, mother, let me sleep just a little while longer. James, open your eyes this instant. All right. Mother? Mm Mm-hmm? Something's happened. My eyes. Your eyes? I can see, mother. The fussiness is gone. Your face is as clear as can be. I can see. Well, my pa promised me a horse and buggy on my 18th birthday. I'm going to polish the buggy and brush the horse and go courting Claire Patton. (laughs) (laughs) Good luck, Ethan. Me, I plan to save up and buy a good farm before I think about courting and marrying. I want to have the biggest and best farm in Somerset County. What about you, James? What's your dream? I want to be a scholar. (laughs) A scholar? (laughs) Yes, I want to get a good education. Better forget school, James. You're too old. Never catch up now. Just stick with farm work. You don't understand. I feel worthless. I can't read or write or keep accounts. I wish I'd never been born. James, are you sure this is what you want? You're 19 years old. You'll be out of place in an elementary school. I don't care about that, Father. I must take this chance to get an education. Your father and I can't do much to help you. I'm not asking anything. I know. But here, 
Your wages for working on the farm. Father. Hush, you have it coming. And here's three dollars for the tuition. I made you a suit of clothes. Take it. And enough bread for six days. We'll see you on Saturday. Each Monday, I walked the five miles to school in St. Albans, Maine, and returned home on Saturday. I studied 18 hours of every 24 to catch up with my age group. James White, as preceptor of St. Albans Academy, it is my pleasure to present you with this certificate stating your qualifications to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Don't thank me, Mr. White. The credit goes to you. When you first came here, you couldn't work a simple problem in <laughs> single rule of three. <laughs> I couldn't tell a verb from an adverb or an adjective. Never have I seen a scholar accomplish so much in 12 short weeks. What are your plans now? I have been engaged to teach the Troy District School next term. Good luck. I'm sure you'll be a good teacher. <laughs> In those days, children went to school during the winter months because they were needed to help on the farms in the summer. They learned mostly by endless repetition from ragged, out-of-date books. I had to study hard each night just to stay ahead of my classes. It's good to have you back home, James, now that the school term is over. I sure can use your help around the farm. Father, I hope you won't be angry, but... I plan to return to St. Albans next term. Uh, I don't know, son. You're a good farmer, and I need your help. I've decided that teaching will be my life's work. Father, for the first time, I feel like more than a useless lump of clay. I finally feel like a man. James, I hate to see you leave St. Albans after only five weeks. You have a good mind. I don't intend to put an end to my education, Mr. Allen, but I must earn some money. I won't remain a charge on my parents. Determined to earn my own way, I shouldered my pack in the summer of 1841 and walked 40 miles to the Penobscot River to apply for a job in a sawmill. Mr. White! James White, will you be coming over here for a minute? Yes, Mr. Kelly, what do you want? James, I'd like you to take over the plank and saw. Now, mind, it's a dangerous job, and I understand if you refuse. But it pays 25 cents a day more than the job you're doing now. I'll take it, Mr. Kelly, and thanks. How are we getting along with the plank and saw, Mr. White? I think the blade needs sharpening, Mr. Kelly. Every now and then it gets held up on a knot and I have to crawl under the platform and kick it free. You best be careful doing that, lad. The sock will kick back on you. What's that? There it goes again. I'll get under there and give it a kick. Oh! Are you all right, lad? You better get some help. Get me out of here. The saw buck when I kicked it, my ankle. Easy, lad. Easy. While working at a sawmill on the Penobscot River in 1841, I severely cut my ankle, which caused me to lose a great deal of time from my job and left me with a permanent limp. Well, Mr. White, and how's the ankle today? Much better, Mr. Kelly. I'm ready to return to work. Are you sure, lad? Perhaps you should wait another week. No. I need all the money I'll earn for my schooling come fall. I'll say this, my boy -o. Sure, and I admire your courage. The accident reduced my summer earnings to only $30. In the fall, I limped 40 painful miles home where I collected my books and my scanty wardrobe. I set off for Reedfield to attend the Episcopal Methodist School there. White! Hey, White! Hello, Barnes. How do you think you did on the Latin test today? Poorly, I should say. Not you, though, I'm sure. All you ever think about is studying. After all, I'm here to get an education. Huh. You already know as much as any teacher here about natural philosophy, algebra, Latin, and I don't know what else. 
Why don't you have a little fun once in a while, like the rest of us? <laughs> Studying is fun. I really enjoy my books and what I can learn from them. <laughs> Everybody needs to relax once in a while. A bunch of us are going to play cards tonight. Why don't you join no, us? No, thanks. I have to go to my room and cook my dinner. I've heard about those dinners of yours. Cornmeal pudding and maybe an apple? <laughs> it's filling. It's unpatriotic. I beg your pardon? You know old Tippy Canoe's campaign slogan last year? Two dollars a day and roast beef for everyone. Oh, I'm supposed to eat roast beef to please President Harrison then? Is that it? Do it for yourself. Move out of that rat trap you call a room and come and live in the boarding house with us. We have good meals there. Sorry, but I must make my funds last until the end of the term. Thank you, though, for the invitation. White, your progress has been remarkable. You've conquered all the mathematics we could give you, you're a good grammarian, and you're qualified to teach penmanship. It's been a pleasure to study here, sir. Well, here's your certificate. You know, White... If you were to remain one more year, you could qualify for college. College, sir? Why, I have attended school only 29 weeks and all. Nevertheless, I hope you will consider higher education. Yes, sir. I will. The preceptor's word sent my dream soaring. With expectations high, I started my new teaching assignment in the village of Troy, about 20 miles south of Palmyra. Here's your school, Mr. White. You'll be teaching 50 pupils divided into several grade levels. <clears throat> About uh, 20 of the scholars are your own age, and a <laughs> few are even older. <laughs> Troy Township has a reputation for a good school and good people. I'm sure I'll get along, Mr. Brody. Yes, well, I hope so, Mr. White. I sincerely hope so. Well, Mr. White, how's it gone so far? Very well, Mr. Brody. I get along splendidly with my class, and I've made many good friends among the parents and townspeople. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. My scholars are so responsive and eager to learn that the time passes swiftly. Here it is, a new year already. Happy 1842. <laughs> Attention, class. Hold it down a minute. I've got something to say. That's better. Now I can hear myself think. <laughs> I'm engaged to teach this school next term. Should I return then, I could not ask anyone to obey my orders better than you have this term. Hello, Mother. James, oh, you're home. Oh, I give you a big hug, except my hands are covered with flour. That's all right, Mother. <laughs> a little flour won't hurt these clothes. Let's have that hug. Oh, oh, it's so good to have you home. How's Father? Your father will be in from the hill pasture for supper soon, and he's feeling just fine. All of us are in good health, physically and spiritually. Have you been attending to your religion, James? Now, Mother... Teaching school is a job that takes all seven days of the week, correcting papers, preparing tests, and dozens of other duties. No, I have not been to church much this past winter. Son, I fear for your soul. <laughs> oh, come now. I was baptized into the Christian denomination when I was 15, and have you ever heard me swearing or seen me drinking? <laughs> no, no, and I'm glad of that. But the way you buried yourself in study and teaching makes me fear. I think you love this world more than you love Christ. Uh, well, how are my friends in town? Have you seen them lately? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. Brother Oaks of Boston has been lecturing at our meeting house on the second coming of Christ about the year 1843. Oh, Mother. A good reformation has followed his lectures, and most of your schoolmates have experienced religion. But, Mother, this preacher Oaks is a Millerite. I suppose you can call him that... But his teachings come from the Bible and not from any man. But, Mother, this Miller person is a fanatic. He professes to know more than Jesus himself. Christ said, But that day and that hour knoweth no man, neither the Son, but the Father only. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Remember that one? Well, yes, but... God I... gave the time to Noah so he could warn the world. But Paul said... 
Know that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night? Uh Aha, but he was speaking of the ungodly. They will not receive the warning. They will not be looking for Christ, but the righteous will. All right, Mother, all right. I'll go to the meetings with you and keep an open mind. Night after night, I listened to the powerful sermons and heard my friends and neighbors give testimony. I heard my schoolmates speak of the love of Christ and was convinced that God's voice was being heard in the Advent movement. But my conviction brought me a problem. James, you seem preoccupied. Is there something on your mind? I wish I had never gone to those Advent meetings. (sighs) Now there's this voice in my head. I've tried to work it off in the fields, but it won't let me alone. What voice? It keeps telling me to go out and warn people about the Lord's coming. Visit your scholars, it says. My pupils in Troy. Mother, I don't want to do it. I have other plans. Have you prayed about it, son? Oh, how I've prayed. The other night, high on a hill under the stars, I fell on my knees and begged God to leave me alone. Did you receive an answer? Just that voice saying, visit your scholars. Visit your scholars. No, I will not. Where are you going? Up to my room to pack for school. That is my destiny. Why, James White, where are you headed? Howdy, Elder Bridges. I'm on my way to Newport Academy. I'm heading into Newport. Up in. I'll give you a lift. Well, I'm grateful, sir. It's a long hike. Getting up there. You know, you're getting more education than most young men around Palmyra. Now that's a responsibility. You should give some thought to going into the ministry and becoming a preacher. Spreading the word of God, James. Just think of it. All during the drive, Elder Bridges talked my ear off about its being my duty to become a minister, which was the last subject I wanted to hear. When he finally let me off at the school, I was greatly relieved. Well, Mr. White, you're all signed up for your classes. You'll begin first thing Monday morning. By the way, have you found a place to live? Yes, ma'am. I have a room just a few blocks away from the school. It's quiet, and I should be able to study very well there. The first permanent conquest of Britain by the Romans took place in A.D. Oh, why can't I remember? Was it AD 36? The Romans occupied Britain from the lower Cornish Peninsula to the present Scottish border. Queen Boadicea of the Iceni in AD... Stop it! Stop! I'll go! I'll go visit my scholars! In the spring of 1842, I finally decided to obey the voice in my head that told me to witness to my scholars. With a suddenly light heart, I picked up my hat, left my studies, and started out for Troy, Maine on foot. (sighs) Just a few more miles. Hmm? Hmm? I have a feeling I should stop at this cottage. I don't want to spend the night with strangers. Well, it won't hurt to ask for a drink of water. Sit down. I'm glad you came. Sir, you've been weeping. What's the matter? I... I just buried my only son. I feel terrible. 
I see you hold a Bible in your hand. Can you not find comfort there? I'm not a Christian. My burden seems greater than I can bear. Will, will you stay the night with me? Of course. And I hope I can bring you some comfort. Do you not know that Jesus is willing to carry your burden for you? How can you know that? He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. He bowed in prayer, and my new friend seemed relieved. In the morning, I helped him to erect the family altar and went on my way. All nature seemed to join my glad heart in the praise of God. <laughs> what a beautiful morning. Go into that house. Wh what? Who said that? It must have been my imagination. But I have a... Such a strong feeling, I'd better do it. Why, schoolmaster, come in. Olivia Porter, how nice to see you. Is your father in? No, but mother is. Mother! Willie! Mason! Arlene, come see who's paid us a visit. Mr. White, what are you doing in Troy? Mrs. Porter, I've come with a very special purpose. Lately, I've learned some wonderful truths that I would like to share with you. Truths, schoolmaster? Whatever do you mean? It's about the soon coming of Jesus, but, well, it will take a little time to explain. May I study the Bible with you and have prayer? Oh, schoolmaster, that's so kind of you. But first, let me send the children after the neighbors so they can hear, too. Thank you all for coming. It is gratifying to see so many here. The news I have for you is very important. First, how many of you are professed Christians? Oh, none of you. Oh, I guess not, schoolmaster. But we have heard that Jesus might be coming soon. Yep, we've heard all some such. That's what Mr. Miller preaches, ain't it? Been hearing it a lot lately. Heard it at the meetings here in town. What you've heard is true. But isn't there supposed to be a millennium first? I always heard he wasn't coming in person, just in our hearts like. Some mm -hmm. folks was talking about it at the general store, but... They were saying he's coming on a cloud. Tell us what you know about it, schoolmaster. The best way to start is to tell what happened to me. Like many of you, I thought William Miller was a fanatic. Who... And so, my friends, the 2300 days, or years, are to end sometime in 1843. Then Jesus will come to earth in person. We must get ourselves right with God. With your permission, I will now kneel in prayer. But you're not Christians. I didn't expect you to kneel with me. Oh, we want to be ready too, schoolmaster. Please pray for us. Yes, please. please pray. We need your prayers. God bless you, brother. As I visited my scholars, it seemed to me that the Lord could not have selected a duty more humbling to my pride. One day, I went to visit the chairman of the school board who had hired me to teach at Troy. I'm very sorry, Mr. White, to find you in this state of mind. Please, sir, just let me pray with you. Well, you're a good teacher and a gentleman. I shall not forbid you. In a few days, I had visited all of my scholars and was on my way home with the sweet assurance that I had done my duty. When I visited the place a few weeks later, a general reformation was in progress. Lectures were held during the summer, and by winter most of the people in the town had embraced religion. I'm pleased that your trip to Troy Village went so well, son. Will you go back soon to continue God's work? Mother, 
I have done God's work, and it's all that I'm going to do. I want to get on with my life to continue my education. If you believe in the Advent, why bother with an education? Why? Mother, I'll need all the education I can get if I want to teach. Uh, your mother is right, James. If the Lord is coming in the next year or so, isn't it silly to spend your time in school instead of preaching to warn the world? Me? A preacher? I feel so... Unworthy. Son, you you just be willing and let God take care of the worthy. Where are you going? To talk with Eldridge Smith, my roommate at St. Albans and Reedfield. But he's not a Christian. How can he give you counsel on spiritual matters? He's a good, honest man. Besides, we always tell each other everything. And besides, I just don't see how I dare to preach when I have so little education. Don't you think I'm right, Eldridge? Well, James, I don't know whether Jesus will come in 1843, but you obviously believe it. I do. Then I think it well for me to say, follow the convictions of your own mind. <sighs> You're right, Eldridge. I shall make a speaking appointment right away. Thank you for your candor and good counsel. How did the congregation accept you, son? Oh, they didn't laugh, well, at least not out loud. But it was a lean time for me, and I was so embarrassed. Worst of all, one woman called me elder. Oh, well, <laughs> now, what's so bad about that? I don't want to be an elder. The word upset me so much, I don't remember anything else that happened all day. Well, you'll have another chance when you speak with those two young preachers who are visiting the area. Oh, I don't even want to think about it. I'm sorry the meeting was such a trial to you, son. Mother, I was so humiliated. I became so confused. I couldn't even finish. I thought the Lord was supposed to sustain those who serve him. James, has it occurred to you that your unwillingness and lack of humility prevent your being sustained? You're right, Father. From now on, I will live only for Christ and his gospel. With my decision came peace and freedom. I also felt the importance of studying the Advent doctrine in earnest. In September, uh, an acquaintance and I attended a huge gathering of Advent believers in eastern Maine. Look, Elder, there's the great tent. I hear it seats about 4,000 people. Yes, Brother White. It was made especially for Elder Mila with funds raised at the East Kingsington Camp Meeting. Let's hurry and get seats. They say hundreds of folks have to be turned away at each meeting. Elder Miller taught that scriptural prophecies are not mysterious and impenetrable, but that the Bible, if it is what it purports to be, will explain itself. The prophecies of Daniel are God's warning to the earth to give people time to prepare for the soon coming of Jesus and the end of the world. But, Brother Miller, the Bible says God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He won't let anyone be lost. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I think that's clear enough. Oh, but Revelation is a book of symbols. Well, then, what about the book of Matthew? The Son of Man shall gather out of his kingdom all them that do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Well, it does sound ominous. And Malachi says plainly, the day that cometh shall burn them up. I see your point, sir. Father Miller's preaching is clear and powerful, Elder. He's given me much to think about. He's given us all much to think about. Oh, look! See those two men? The two distinguished men coming this way? Yes, the one on the left is a newspaper editor. I wonder what he has to say about Father Miller. You know, Obadiah, I took a prejudice against Mr. Miller when he first came among us. 
I thought he had made a glaring error in interpreting the scripture prophecies to, to mean the world would end in 1843. Have you changed your mind, then? After attending his lectures... I'm convinced he's a man of excellent character. It's true that everywhere he goes, a revival follows. He reaches minds no one else seems to have any influence over. What impresses me most is that he makes his arguments so forcefully that, well, if his premises are correct, one cannot escape his conclusions. <laughs> 